Romans stating that man has exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man. 1700 years later, Voltaire, an enlightenment philosopher, remarked, if God created us in his own image, we have returned the favor. Another 300 years and we still find this to be true. Man in his sinfulness remains the same. We can all recall moments in which we have rejected God and experienced the consequences. Even now we see this very plainly on a national scale. Well today John MacArthur makes it clear what God expects of leaders, their nations, and the consequences when those demands aren't met. It's an encouragement to know that in the midst of man's failings, God is still in control. And we who put our faith in the perfect leader and King Jesus Christ have a constant hope, joy, and unshakable citizenship in the eternal kingdom. Make sure you have your Bible handy. We're going to do a little work in the scripture as we think about God's requirements for rulers. Obviously, this is on the mind of people. It is drummed at us incessantly, day after day, month after month, seemingly year after year, as we are overexposed to the political scene in our own country and others around the world. And there are all kinds of perspectives and all kinds of viewpoints and all kinds of pundits weighing in on what should be the characteristics of leaders and how governments should operate, etc., etc. But just to clear the air, uh, I have really nothing to say about the politics of the United States of America, or for that matter, any other country. But I am going to show you from the Word of God the measuring rod by which you will be able to evaluate any and every situation in terms of leadership and rule in any nation. There is no law that is true but God's law. There is no worship that is true but the worship of the true God. There is no morality that is true but the morality revealed in Scripture. And there are no blessings for individuals or nations apart from honoring God and His law. And again, I would like to say it this way, a nation that lives under the power and influence of the law of God will enjoy the richest blessings of common grace. The chaos of the world, national chaos, at any point, anywhere, is always related to the rejection of God and the rejection of true worship and the rejection of His law and His word and obedience to Him. His law defines what is good. His law defines what is evil. His law promotes good. His law restrains evil. And Romans 13 says that all government officials are ministers of God for the punishment of evildoers and the welfare of those who do what is good. An irreligious, immoral government that cares nothing about God and nothing about His law will self-destruct in the disintegration of its own godless complacency. Now, there are many ways to support what I've tried to say to you, this perspective, but I've, I've chosen one that I hope will be helpful. It's a clear one. Let's start with leadership. What does God require of rulers? Let's start there. I want to show you this by having you turn in your Bible to Deuteronomy 26. Deuteronomy 26. Children of Israel about ready to go into the Promised Land. It's a very familiar setting. Deuteronomy means the second law. God reiterated and gave them His law as they were about to, after 40 years of wandering, to enter into the Promised Land. God tells them here how He wants them to live. And what he's going to say to them here as they are gathered outside the promised land and about to enter is not related to personal salvation. This isn't about personal salvation. This is about national behavior. This is about national life. He's talking to them about how they are to behave as a nation. So we could we could pick it up in a lot of places, but let's uh, let's look at chapter 26 verse 16. This day the Lord your God commands you to do these statutes and ordinances. 
You shall therefore be careful to do them with all your heart and with all your soul. Now God is going to lay out what he wants them to do. You have today declared the Lord to be your God, this is nationally, and that you would walk in his ways and keep his statutes, his commandments and his ordinances and listen to his voice. The Lord has today declared you to be his people, a treasured possession as he promised you and that you should keep all his commandments and that he will set you high above all nations which he has made for praise, fame, and honor, and that you shall be a consecrated people of the Lord your God as he has spoken. He, again, he's not talking about personal salvation. He's talking about national conduct. If you will conduct yourselves in this way, recognizing the true God, obeying his laws, God will elevate you as a nation. This is obedience on a national scale results in verse 19 in praise and fame and honor and testimony. Now into chapter 27. In chapter 27, God starts laying out the rules. And you're familiar with this. Moses and the elders of Israel charge the people saying, keep all the commandments which I command you today. Keep them all. So it shall be on the day when you cross the Jordan to the land which the Lord your God gives you, that you shall set up for yourselves large stones and coat them with lime and write on them all the words of this law when you cross over so that you may enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. Again, common grace, milk and honey, benefits, physical benefits. You're going to a rich and blessed land. You will you will experience many of God's rich blessings, but you must keep his law. So he calls for a ceremony. You know the ceremony between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, two mountains in the vicinity. One is going to be the, the mountain of cursing, verse 13. The, the curses are going to be recited on Mount Ebal, and the blessings are going to be recited on Mount Gerizim. God is going to lay out, if you disobey my law, this is what's going to happen. If you obey my law, this is what's going to happen. First, come the curses. Verse 15, Cursed is the man who makes an idol or a molten image, an abomination to the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsman, and sets it up in secret. All the people shall answer and say, Amen. Cursed is he who dishonors his father or mother. All the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who moves his neighbor's boundary mark. All the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who misleads a blind person on the road. All the people shall say, Amen. You see, these are all basic behaviors. This is morality. This is ethics. Cursed is the one, verse 19, who distorts the justice do an alien, an orphan, and a widow, and all the people shall say amen. Cursed is he who lies with his father's wife, because he has uncovered his father's skirt, and all the people shall say amen. Cursed is he who lies with any animal, and all the people shall say amen. Cursed is he who lies with his sister, the daughter of his mother, or his father or his mother, and all the people shall say amen. Cursed is he who lies with his mother-in-law, and all the people shall say amen. Cursed is he who strikes his neighbor in secret, and all the people shall say amen. Cursed is he who accepts a bride to strike down an innocent person, and all the people shall say amen. Cursed is he who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them, and all the people shall say amen. This is, this is all national, ethical, moral behavior. Then in verse 1 of chapter 28, flips over to the blessings. Now it shall be if you diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments, which I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. God blesses any nation that obeys him. And the Lord, verse 7, will cause your enemies to rise up against you to be defeated before you. Again, national protection comes to an obedient nation. Your enemies come against you and go at it one way and flee before you seven ways. Verse 8, the Lord will command the blessing upon you in your barns and in all that you put your hand to will bless you in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Prosperity 
the Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself as he swore if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways and so verse 10 all the peoples of the earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord they'll be afraid of you the Lord will make you abound in prosperity in the offspring of your body and the offspring of your beast and the produce of your ground and the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you do you understand that this is not about personal salvation this is about national obedience to God he will open your, uh, his good storehouse in verse 12 and give rain on your land and bless the work of your hand and make you as the head and not the tail. Verse 14, do not turn aside from any of the words which I command you today. The only way to bless a nation, the only path of blessing a nation can ever take is the path of obedience to the word of God. There is no blessing apart from that. Verse 15, if you do not obey the Lord your God to, deserve, to observe to do all his commandments, verse 15, and his statutes, which I charge you today, then these curses will come upon you. You'll be cursed in the city, cursed in the country, cursed in your basket, your kneading bowl goes back through all the same things that he promised blessing for. And it gets worse. Verse 32, your sons and daughters will be given to another people while your eyes look on and yearn for them continually. There'll be nothing you can do. And he goes on and on and on with all these curses for disobedience. They are vivid curses. You can read them on your own. They go all the way to verse 68. It's a horrendous revelation from God. He even tells him he's going to smite them, verse 60, with all the diseases of Egypt. Every sickness, every plague will be few in number, whereas you were as numerous as the stars of heaven, because you did not obey the Lord your God, verse 62. Verse 66, your life will hang in doubt. You'll be in dread night and day. Have no assurance of your life. morning you'll say I wish it were evening verse 67 in the evening you'll say I wish it were morning that's the history of the Jews history of Israel drop down to verse 10 in chapter 29 you stand today all of you before the Lord your God your chiefs your tribes your elders your officers even all the men of Israel your little ones your wives the alien who is within your camps from the one who chops your wood to the one who draws your water that you may enter into the covenant with the Lord your God and into his oath which the Lord your God is making with you today in order that he may establish you today as his people that he may be your God just as he spoke to you and as he swore to your fathers Abraham Isaac and Jacob now not with you alone am I making this covenant and this oath but both with those who stand here with us today in the presence of the Lord our God and with those who are not with us here today every generation in the future every generation in the future your faithfulness is required to the law of God over in verse 22 of chapter 29 it says now the generation to come your sons who raise up after you and the foreigner who comes from a distant land when they see the plagues of the land and the diseases with which the Lord has afflicted it will say all its land is brimstone and salt a burning waste unsown unproductive no grass grows in it verse 24 all the nations will say why has the Lord done thus to this land why this great outburst of anger Verse 25, the then men will say, because they forsook the covenant of the Lord, the God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went and served other gods and worshipped them. They brought in other religions. And the anger of the Lord in verse 27 burned against them to bring upon it every curse written in this book. And the Lord uprooted them from their land in anger and fury and great wrath, cast them into another land as it is this day. This is such a profoundly mysterious work of God that verse 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe all the words of this law. There are some things God keeps secret. Listen, this isn't one of them. 
That's what that verse is saying. This is not one of them. God tells a nation how to live. Verse 1 of chapter 30. So it shall be when all of these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind in all nations where the Lord your God has banished you. In other words, take this message to every nation that you ever set foot in. Why? Because God has the same standard for all nations. Israel is the witness nation to the world that God blesses obedience and curses disobedience. It is not a badge of honor that the United States of America is so relentlessly devoted to separating the church and the state. That is a destructive division. Israel was to be the witness to the world of what happens when you obey and what happens when you disobey and they have played that role. Times of obedience, they were blessed. Times of disobedience, they were cursed. Deuteronomy 30 is a very important chapter, by the way, because there's a promise here you need to hear. Verse 2, And you return to the Lord your God and obey Him with all your heart and soul, according to all that I command you today, you and your sons. Then the Lord your God will restore you from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. That's the future. That's going to happen in the future. The outcasts, verse 4, are going to be gathered from the ends of the earth. The Lord is going to bring them back to their land. That, of course, will be fulfilled in the coming of Christ, at His return, and the establishment of the Messianic Kingdom. This powerful message of blessing and cursing comes to a culmination down at the end of chapter 30. Verse 15, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways, and to keep His commandments and His statutes and His judgments, that you may live and multiply, and that the Lord your God may bless you in the land where you are entering to possess it. But if your heart turns away, and you will not obey, but are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You will not prolong your days in the land where you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess it. I I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants, by loving the Lord your God, by obeying His voice, and by holding fast to Him. For this is your life and the length of your days that you may live in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give them. You obey me, you'll prosper. You'll live in the land. You disobey me, you will perish. Perish. The promise of Deuteronomy 30 is the future salvation of Israel. That's a promise repeated by Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Zephaniah, Zechariah, and Malachi. But the principle is this, as a nation, as a people, love and obey God, and you will have a life of prosperity. Reject God, bring in other gods, and you will have death and adversity. Choose God, choose life. So God has declared unmistakably that blessing is for the nation that acknowledges Him and obeys His law. It is not wise to welcome all religions. It is wise to proclaim the one true God and the one true religion and the one true authority, Holy Scripture. Otherwise, you're just full of idols. And you have violated the first commandment. 
you have other gods before the true God. I think we have to have this perspective. God calls all people to honor him, all nations. Listen to Exodus 9, 16. But I have raised you up for this purpose, that I might show my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. In other words, God has raised up his people not to simply be the recipient of his blessing, but to be the model of how to live as a people that are blessed. Joshua 4, 24. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord. God used Israel as an illustration of the blessing of fearing the Lord. 1 Kings 8, verse 60, So that all the nations of the earth may know that the Lord is God and that there is no other. And a nation that does not affirm that is an idolatrous nation that will experience the curses of God. In 2 Chronicles, and there are a lot of scriptures that speak to this issue, I've tried to pick maybe the most important ones. In 2 Chronicles 6, verse 32, you read also concerning the foreigner who is not from your people Israel, when he comes from a far country for your great name's sake and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm, when they come and pray toward this house, then hear from heaven from your dwelling place and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your people Israel and that they may know that this house which I have built is called by your name. Every foreigner who calls on God will be heard by God so that the world knows that God's blessing is not just for Israel but for all the peoples of the earth who call on the name of the true and living God. Psalm 33.8 says, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Listen to this. Let all the nations of the world revere him. That is a command to the United States of America. Let all the nations of the world revere him. Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Praise and extol him, all you peoples. God didn't require anything of Israel that he doesn't require of every nation. What God required of Israel is exactly what he requires of every nation. Rulers must understand that. They are, as I quoted earlier, Romans 13, 1, servants of God. The powers that be are ordained of God and the rulers are the servants of God or ministers of God. of the true God, for the well-being of man, for the expression of the fullness of common grace. Listen to what Peter said in 1 Peter 2, 13. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king or a ruler as one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. He's writing to people scattered in the Gentile world. And he says, governors and kings and rulers are sent by God to punish the people who violate his law and to protect the ones who obey it. Again, what God requires of Israel, he requires of every nation. It doesn't have a lesser standard. So what is the responsibility initially of a leader? responsibility of a leader is to call a nation to the worship of the true living 
God of Holy Scripture. And the second responsibility of a leader of a nation is to call that nation to obedience to the revealed law of God in the Bible. Every ruler needs to understand God is the true king. If you do not honor him, you will be judged. One final illustration is in Acts 12. Acts 12. At the end of the chapter, verse 20. This is Herod surveying his greatness. He was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. And with one accord they came to him, and having won over Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they were asking for peace because their country was fed by the king's country. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal apparel, took his seat on the rostrum, and began delivering an address to them. The people kept crying out, The voice of a god and not of a man. He is deity. He is a God. Really? Verse 23. Here's the end of Herod Day. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he didn't give God the glory. He was eaten by worms and died. What an ending. God's standards for rulers in any nation, Israel or any other nation, are the same. To worship him, honor him, uphold his law, call the people to true worship and true obedience. When that doesn't happen, God moves in judgment. It's a constant question, what makes a great leader? What sets some people apart from all others in the level and impact of their leadership? Let's go back to the beginning. Leadership really involves just a few things. One, strong conviction about the truth, about something that is considered to be reality. Secondly, courage. Courage to do whatever that conviction demands you do in whatever situation, no matter what the price. Three, the ability to engage other people, ennoble them, arm them, mobilize them to affect the end driven by those convictions. Leaders are people who are driven by conviction, who have the courage to live out those convictions at any price, and who can influence other people to join them in accomplishing the goal that those convictions demand. That's the stuff that makes for leadership.